When I was uh, <clears throat> preparing for the last speaker here, of course, I got a bio and all kinds of comments, and I forgot the congressman is coming. So I can't say too much about Gary because I don't have enough information about the congressman. But just a couple observations. We are very privileged to have this afternoon Congressman Rush Holt, who's a congressman here in the 12th District, and of course has been a professor here at Princeton University and is a uh, congressman who all represents the district and the state and the country, I might add. And of course, yep. And, of, and perhaps the most important observation I, I know about the congressman, that he was a four-time champion on Jeopardy. Isn't that right? Five, actually. Five, actually. Five-time winner. Right. And Gary Rose, who was also going to be with us, uh, I won't read all his stuff, but of course he had worked for many years in the international investment banking at Goldman Sachs and was a longtime confidant of our governor, Governor For uh, Corzine. And of course the governor convinced, coerced, or otherwise asked uh, Gary to join his administration as responsible for uh, developing economic development and strategy for the state of New Jersey. So I thought what we were going to do, a little change, Congressman Holt's going to make some comments, and then uh, Gary is going to come up and make some comments, and then we're going to keep them both here to make some comments back and forth and engage with you on discussions not only on economic development, but almost anything else that may drift into your mind or into, the, uh, into our two uh, illustrious presenters here. So without further ado, Congressman Holt, please. Well, um, I'm delighted that Princeton is doing this. I'm delighted that I'm here. Um, I'm the least uh, expert person in the room, so that's reason enough for me to be brief. Uh, it really is good that Princeton is doing this, because any time in any place in New Jersey, people talk about uh, economic development, and they say, and Princeton will contribute to this in some sense, in some, uh, not usually monetarily, but in some sense. Um, and uh, the, the name of Princeton is invoked uh, so often, uh, you know, they, they say that this, well, just as Stanford uh, gave us Silicon Valley and MIT gave us Route 128 and the, the, the Triangle Universities gave economic development uh, in that area. Um, I don't know whether the people at Princeton know how much of a burden has been placed on their shoulders uh, <laughs> uh, to, uh, to produce the economic development uh, of New Jersey. So anyway, it is appropriate that it's here. And it's appropriate that we finish uh, with Gary uh, at the last talking about the public sector, which uh, from the point of view of which I wanted to make a couple of remarks also, because so many of the issues that, uh, that we end up talking about, even the so-called private development, uh, comes back to the public sector, comes back to what support, uh, what encouragement, uh, what money should come uh, from the public s sector. And I would argue that um, there is too little emphasis on sustainability in a different sense than Karen was talking about. Karen was talking about sustainability from energy and environmental, from the energy and environmental point of view. But um, the economic sustainability um, seems to me gets too little attention. Uh, and it is because in the public sector, people tend to be reactive, not proactive. Um, they look at this long list of projects that various developers have proposed, and they'll pick and choose a few. Um, rather than making the future by, in other words, by planning the future, by not just letting it happen, uh, but rather by uh, shaping it and choosing the kind of development that will provide sustained, sustainable growth. Uh, here in New Jersey, uh, some of us have been involved in something that goes by the name of Einstein's Alley. Uh, Catherine Kish is here. I'm pleased. It's one of the co-chairs of, of that, co-directors of, of that. Um, and it is based on the idea 
that um, the most sustainable kind of development, economic development, at least what we think can be the most sustainable kind here in New Jersey, is based on research and development. In other words, business and industry that draws from the innovation. Now, Karen characterized that as high tech. And more often than not, that's what R&D-based industry means, but not necessarily. Um, it is something more than, than the influx, the shot in the arm kind of development of a stadium uh, or an office complex, um, but rather something that will, continues to provide the growth. Um, the public sector should be involved in the decision making about what is going to be sustainable. And it's certainly appropriate for the government to put some money in, but of course everyone has to remember that um, the government gives and the government takes away. <laughs> or actually what happens more often in development, the government gives and then the government goes away. Um, so, so it is um, it, uh, too often, whether it's a defense factory uh, or some other thing, uh, uh, or for that matter a stadium, uh, people are so eager when the government gives the money uh, and then uh, they are surprised uh, when, the, when the government uh, goes away. So uh, you've been talking a lot today, and I'm sorry I missed uh, Bruce Katz's talk, and I'm going to catch up on that. But I gather you've been talking a lot on how you finance the development. Uh, I want to make sure that one never loses focus on what you finance and how you involve the public sector in choosing those things that will have ongoing productivity growth, ongoing economic growth. Um, and I would argue that stadiums and things like that don't fit in that. Um, the, uh, not that you should never build stadiums, but if you're interested in long-term economic development, I think that's probably not where it is. So. Einstein's Alley is based on the idea that we have a strong R&D tradition here in New Jersey that we should build on, that the economic activity that comes from R&D and often through entrepreneurs is less susceptible to uh, economic cycles. Uh, it is a kind of... of um, development that is quicker on its feet and therefore more sustainable. Um, and it is, it can and should be tied in with the other community decisions about livability and workforce development. So education and environment uh, and those other things that are attractive to mid-level uh, uh, corporate types as well as the senior corporate types and uh, on down to the workers. So when I say the economic development should be based on research and development, I don't mean everyone should be wearing a lab coat, uh, but rather uh, the entrepreneurial activity that comes from that, that we've seen here in New Jersey that we lived on for so long before Bell Labs kind of uh, uh, withered and blew away and uh, uh, before uh, that we still live on in the pharmaceutical industry but we worry about as more pharmaceuticals are uh, taking their economic activity uh, uh, elsewhere. And uh, if we uh, if we build on that, uh, I think uh, uh, we will be better off and sustain it more in the long run. I don't know how we finance it. Uh, I hope to learn more from you about that. And I'm not even sure how the public sector 
should be involved in making those decisions about the kind of sustainable development uh, that we do finance. But I want to make sure that here in New Jersey, uh, we don't lose sight of the question of what are we financing, not just how. We're going to ask the regional planet. Why don't you come down and stay here? All right. Well, I'll watch Gary from here. I'm finishing Ron Chernow's biography of Alexander Hamilton. And I didn't know until I read it that he would have been a Princeton graduate had Princeton been willing to accommodate the speed that he wanted to go through his college career. I think he wanted to finish in six months. <laughs> and uh, King's College, now Columbia, accommodated him after Princeton uh, couldn't. Well, Princeton A big miss. Princeton accommodated Aaron Burke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and having read Vidal's book and just finishing this book, I think I would have done a swap. <laughs> so anyway, uh, thank you for, uh, for having me. Uh, Rich and I have uh, down through a couple budget words together, at least on the transition side. Um, and I'm delighted to be with you, and I'm really delighted that Congressman Holt can be here. He and I have done some of these sessions together, and uh, he brings a, a, a unique perspective to these <coughs> kinds of discussions. Uh, three brief things, and then we're going to open it up, so you ought to start thinking about what you'd like to talk about. A little about what I do, um, and... It's Karen. Karen McKeon's here. Karen is part of the Office of Economic Growth. Um, when the governor campaigned uh, for this office, he uh, made an economic speech in March of 2005, so it's almost three years ago, and laid out a framework for what he wanted to achieve as far as economic direction for the state. And it basically had two components. Uh, he, was, he, he did three, but if, if I were to abbreviated, he basically said that he needed to uh, bring financial disciplines to the state, uh, but he also needed to have a strategy so that we could grow our way through and out of uh, the, uh, the constraints that we, he that we do find ourselves in in New Jersey. And so he created an office, which is a small, by definition, by design office, uh, which uh, Karen and I sit in which does two principal things. Um, it's in the governor's office. It does economic strategy, and we put out one uh, strategic template about a year and a half ago. We're pregnant with another one, but i got to get the governor's attention before it goes. Uh, but it's nothing more than an updating uh, and a fill out, filling out a couple of uh, placeholders that we put in, particularly on um, logistics and port development and urban strategy. Uh, and so it's not going to be revolutionary. Uh, and second is coordination. And uh, what we did is create dotted lines between the governor's office and all of the 21 departments, commissions, authorities, whatever, that deal with the private sector. And uh, we work together. We have a group called the ACE Council, which is an acronym, Action Council on the Economy. Uh, we get together once a month uh, to deal with common problems. Uh, it is populated by the number one or number two people, looking Karen in every one of those agencies. Uh, we also create ad hoc subgroups that deal with very particular issues, whether it's a big project or whether it's something like ports fields or ground fields. Uh, uh, and Camden has one because it ought to have one. Um, and that's principally what we do. And then we go elephant hunting for big corporate opportunities against Seth Pinsky and New York State and uh, Pennsylvania and Maryland and Massachusetts. Um, but that's really not what we're supposed to be focusing our time because EDA works really well. We've reorganized commerce. They work really well. Uh, there's a role for the governor when we need them. Um, but what we do, and I want to pick up on something that Congressman Holt said, 
Uh, we meet once a week uh, in our office for two reasons. One is because we're very small, we need to back each other up because we never know who's going to get pulled out. And the second is, frankly, taking a page, and this may be old hat to folks at the Wilson School, but taking a page of advice that I got from a friend who had worked in the White House and called me when I volunteered to take this job. Uh, and he said, keep a list, a short list of things you want to get done. Uh, because if you don't have those over-the-horizon projects and you don't measure yourself against them, you're going to get consumed by, consumed by crisis, crisis management, and that is absolutely the case. And so we keep a list, and we reprioritize, but I think our list is generally six items long, and Beth, don't ask me for it. I'm not going to give it to you because a lot of the stuff is not public. Some of the stuff was, for example, energy master plan. Some of the stuff you would instantly recognize. Some of the stuff you wouldn't. Uh, but we limit ourselves, we discipline ourselves, and we ask ourselves reasonably periodically, how are we doing? And if we're not doing well, then there's really, you have to reassess, does it belong on the list? Uh, or if it is on the list, we better get moving on it. And all of these projects, the only thing I can assure you is that all of these projects have implications, lead times or implications, which are well beyond the tenure of John Corsak, whether it's two more years or six more years. These are things that we need to be working on because they're important for the state. And if we're not doing them, we're not sure they're going to get done. So that's kind of the overlay of generally what we do. The second thing I wanted to talk about is what's going on in state government now because it is so topical. And we are between the State of the State Address and the Governor's Budget Address next Tuesday. And this is not a commercial message, but it is our reality. Uh, the Governor laid out <coughs> uh, pretty clearly in January what he believes uh, the elements are of the financial crisis that the state confronts and his pro proposed four-point uh, address to that crisis. Uh, I would say, and I'm not saying this because, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to butter up my boss, but I think he did the state a tremendous service by sticking his neck out and telling people what they didn't want to hear. Uh, and he then went out on a, and is in the middle of a 21-county roadshow, and I've gone to some of them, and they're painful, and they are close to being abusive. And if I... And I, this is a guy who, uh, you know, I, I confess I've got a lot of respect for and a lot of affection for, but a governor shouldn't have to take what he takes. I guess, Beth, I'd appreciate if that doesn't go on the paper. But, you know, you have to respect the office. You can't forget what the office is. But he wants to go out there and make the case. And what I would say is, uh, and it's become very personalized, and I don't understand this. What I would say is, if we start, whether it's the Wisniewski alternative of yesterday or something else, if we're starting to talk about alternatives, then he's done the state a great service. Because what he has done is make us understand the consequences of doing nothing. And agreeing on, we may not agree on the same dose of medicine, but we're going to start to agree that medicine is necessary and that we have to start living within our means and doing things so that we can start thinking about the long term instead of just juggling. And so uh, I give him great credit for having the vision and having the courage and, frankly, um, having the tolerance to be subjected to what he knew he would be subjected to when he walked into this. Um, that's the first part. The second part, and for those of you who don't know what the components are, the two most critical ones are freeze the budget and where do we find the money to recapitalize the state. There are some other things about debt and currency, but those are the two key ones. Everybody's been focusing on selling the Turnpike and Parkway and Atlantic City Expressway and whether it's a good idea or public benefit corporations and do they work. And uh, I'd say one thing on that and then I'm going to get off that. The reality is if we were a group of family counselors and somebody walked into our office and said, counselor, I've got a first mortgage 
I've got a second mortgage. I've maxed out my credit cards. I've got reasonably flat economic opportunity. My economic aspirations are growing at about 2 to 3% a year. And I can't pay my bills. One of the things we would say is go home, take an inventory of your assets, and figure out whether you have some assets that you could sell, monetize, liquefy, you name it what you want. Sell it, convert it to cash, pay down some of your obligations, and then figure out how to live within your means. Don't go back to your old lifestyle. Discipline yourself. Maybe you still have to sell your house. Maybe you have to move into an apartment. But you've got to lower your cost of living. But one of the things you do, have, you have to get out of debt because it's unsustainable. It's not a lot different from New Jersey. It really isn't. So what the governor is going to give everybody is a real dose of tough medicine on Tuesday. Uh, and that's going to be how you live within your needs. Now, clearly, we still need some sort of an event to lower our costs of debt service and get the debt back proportionally in line with uh, our revenue generation so that we can live within our means and start to think about what we all want to do over the horizon. Um, but that's not, you know, I submit on Wednesday morning, we're not going to be talking about the turnpike. And if there's any element of our state society that isn't screaming, somebody missed something. Because you don't do, you don't put the brakes on. When we came into office, and I think all these figures are public, we came into office, the expense side of the equation was running at about 16% year, year over year. First year, we cut that to about 7 or 8 and there was a lot of pain. It's now running 6 to 7% with revenues growing 2 to 3%. So you got to gap like that. Um, and if he wants to put a complete break on expenses, uh, that's going to be painful. But it's not going to be nearly as painful. Uh, it's going to be even more painful because of the economic environment that we now find ourselves in. And that's really my point break, uh, which is frankly, the, the area that, I, that we're still trying to figure out. Uh, you, we all understand that the economy has dramatically slowed down. If you look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, adjustment, I think two weeks ago, to the year-end uh, uh, non-farm payroll that came out, it was a downward, a meaningful, I think two-tenths of one percent downward adjustment. The state puts out, and I'm not given any forecast, but the state does its own adjustment, I think, next week. Uh, it is not, it would be surprising if the state's adjustment were anything but consistent with what's happening uh, in the country, particularly given the tremendous amount of um, financial sector operations in the Northeast, uh, which are very nimble at cutting costs, both through the use of contract employees as well as uh, the announced layoffs in, uh, in all the financial services firms. And, you know, you could print out a page on that. And so my guess is uh, that we won't buck the national trend, and maybe it works. I have no idea. Uh, but we find ourselves, and these are people who come in to see us, see Karen, see me, see Karen, uh, I, I had a meeting this morning with somebody, one of their biggest customers filed for bankruptcy. And they're in to talk about an expansion. And he's saying, you know, I'm here, I'm schizophrenic. I'm not sure if I should be expanding or contracting. But that's the point. The point is we have an awful lot of uh, plans in place. Um, and we've got to figure out how we adjust to a world where my guess is state revenues on all of the People who've been sitting up here are going to have to have downward adjustments. It's not just corporate profits. We are going to have to measure, and I think this is the trickiest measure, certainly, that the private sector makes. We have to measure more than the depth of whatever we're going through, call it a recession. It's the duration. When you look at the strategic decisions that companies make, it's how you mobilize your assets so that you are positioned for the upcycle. Because that's, you know, if you, unless you're in a sector like financial services that frankly think people are, don't use this, Beth, jelly beans. 
I keep doing this to you. Uh, come on. <laughs> you know, uh, because they always think they can hire somebody away from somebody else. So uh, the, the sector I came from, I think, sometimes is viewed as having better management than they perhaps really do. But they slash during, de during down times, and they'll hire like crazy and up. Uh, but most of the rest of the private sector is much more deliberate on how much they cut because they don't really want to get caught short when the economy turns. And so the big bets that are going to be made in the big, on the private sector is, is this six months or is this 12 or 18 months? And there is a load of decisions, capital decisions, hiring decisions, new product initiative decisions, all kind of long time horizon stuff that are going to be the critical things that, frankly, a lot of chief executives are going to succeed or fail based on that bet. And it's, not a, and it's going to be a tricky bet. And I used to go through this because... The job I had when I was at Goldman was working with corporate clients. And I can tell you, you get into situations like this, frankly, I guess we're about 16 years since we've been in one that is remotely analogous to this. So there are certainly one or two generations of corporate managers who've never seen an environment like this, and that's a little, that's another issue. But uh, there's going to be some meaningful stuff, and we're going to have to figure out whether we just continue to plug along doing what we you know, have machined ourselves, or whether, which is my view, we're going to have to improvise, all of us, New York City, New York State. In some ways, I could argue New Jersey, and this is, believe me, it's, it's an admission of weakness, is in the unique position of having been in deficit longer. We know how to live with deficits, <laughs> as opposed to people who are going from surpluses to deficits who have to figure out how to struggle with fewer assets. I, when I came into this job, my basic uh, uh, standing um, uh, marching orders were, you have no budget. And if you want to do something, find something to trade in. <laughs> and uh, it was actually rather fascinating. And, I, and I, we talked among ourselves that about a year or so in, uh, we all were in a position where we kind of like to have some discretionary incentive money because we really know how to use it now. Uh, that's not coming soon. Um, <laughs> But I, I would say, I would say that I, um, and I hope this is just not naive to say, I would say as far as New Jersey, but for the economic impact of what's going on in the world and in our country, I think the citizens of New Jersey really get it. I think the amount of anger of, that I've seen at town hall meetings is thoughtful. You know, it's, uh, it's not all thoughtful, but it's in the main thoughtful. It's in the main constructive. I think people really appreciate that there really are things that are special. And this is just not New Jersey, this is the Northeast. We are really all stitched together. I mean, Bob's right. We've had these discussions. Uh, a lot of the things, if we were smarter and wanted to utilize assets better and be more efficient, we'd be much more regional in how we did things. We'd figure out how we did regional incentive programs and dealt with, which will, I don't think, not in my lifetime, but I, I, uh, I, I think we would all agree that incentives are wasteful in the main, uh, but uh, unilateral disarmament is frightening. And so uh, that's not going to happen. <coughs> but but uh, if, we, if we push back from the table, we would all agree, if, if we were a business, that we want to be in the flow business. And the flow business is getting more economic flow to our region. And if we can do that, then we grow the pie and we can all compete with each other a little more cordial and still all benefit because we all feed in the same way. Uh, so that's kind of my, what I do and uh, what the governor's up to and why next Tuesday is so important and finally why all of it is probably not nearly as important what's going on in the world and in the economy right now because there it's not over. I mean, this is one guy, Beth, so I believe it's not over. you got to be careful what I say. Um, I don't think it's over. I don't think it's over in the banking sector, and I certainly don't believe it's over in the corporate sector, and I think what we have seen is that the consumer, there's something that's gone on in the psyche of the consumer, and it may be as simple as when we built, when we migrated towards a consumer society, which is 
built on the confidence that your home is going to go up 8 to 10% a year, and all of a sudden your home drops a little in value, your confidence is dramatically shaken. You put on top of that, you know, all of the excesses of, uh, you know, these uh, subprime resettable mortgages and, frankly, home equity loans that nobody's looked at for the next economic strata, uh, which is leveraged up the, the, the household balance sheet. And you look at the amount of debt that sits on the bank's books on uh, leveraged financial transactions, which are not trading in the marketplace either, and you say to yourself, this is a banking system where lowering interest rates doesn't necessarily affect liquidity, and if you don't believe it, call the Port Authority that last week had a auction, a, a one-week auction note, fail an auction with a thousand other auctions, where you basically buy a piece of paper for a week, and it should have been somewhere around 3%, and when there's no bids in the contract, it goes to the default bid, which is 20%. So for this week, they are paying the rate of the annualized rate of 20%. And they're not alone. It's said that you, you read them in the paper every day. And what that's saying is nobody wants to buy anything. Now, that sector they don't want to buy because it's insured. And if you've been reading the papers, there's a question as to the financial condition of the bond insurance entities because they were also mm -hmm. insuring not only state and municipal governments, which was their traditional business, but guess who else got into the business of insuring, insuring these uh, collateralized debt up? So they've got some of their own issues. That's a long way of saying, look, I tend to be very pessimistic, Beth. And I tend to be very, very defensive. And, uh, you know, and, and that's just how I'm built. But I'm pretty concerned about the state of the economic world. And I don't know what the right combination is uh, that pulls us back and stabilizes things and starts to rebuild a, a sense of confidence because I don't think we're there yet. And as good as the Treasury Secretary is, who's a guy I also know well and have a lot of respect for, uh, and as good as the Chairman of the Fed is, I don't think his dial is doing anything. Um, and we're at a point where nobody knows where the leadership of the country is going to be, and that puts a little bit more of uncertainty into the picture. And of course, then there's the you know the international event risk that we all have, and it basically compounds itself. So New Jersey's got to figure that out. Uh, and I think, frankly, I'd rather have this guy in that in in it's sleeping at drum wacket than anybody else I can think of. So I think I feel a little lucky that he's there and I work for him. Um, and also lucky, frankly, that I got a chance to meet and work with with Karen and a lot of really wonderful people down in Trenton. I have been incredibly pleasantly surprised by the quality of the people that I've had a chance to work with. So it's been a, a great ride for me. Uh, it's not a career. Uh, I came out of nowhere, and pretty soon I'm going to go back to nowhere. And uh, When we pass each other and you're, gonna, you're in the street, you're going to say, eh, I think I may know that. <laughs> you're not going to really know me. And so, that's really all I wanted to say, and I think perhaps the congressman and I can sit and talk about what you want to talk about. Well, they're pulling up seats. It just, I couldn't help but reminisce when the, <coughs> Gary says, 16 years ago, it seems like we were back again. 16 years ago, I said, well, where was I? <laughs> and I was the budget director for Governor Florio. <laughs> right. And you might remember there was a big sales tax increase, <laughs> income tax increase, and we were supposed to fund school aid, right? Eight, eight, and a few other things. And then all of a sudden, the money wasn't coming in. I remember I was so desperate one day, I called up the tax director and I said, will you personally go down and open up those envelopes? There is something the matter. We cannot possibly have negative sales tax growth. We cannot possibly be $150 million off one month into the fiscal year. Something is the matter. I think we're back, maybe, if we are thinking. Yeah. So you may want to go out and sell your stocks. I've already put yeah. my order in. <laughs> Why don't we open up the questions, almost anything. Yes, in the back, in the middle. Uh, uh, Well, let's both answer it because the 
Congressman Holt has a better perspective that something that big is going to be done in Washington. Uh, first of all, you have to see which party wins the White House and what the uh, composition is within Congress. That's those are the ultimate, you know, realities of those two pieces of government. Could it work? We are clearly are at a point where every state in the country is facing, because they've all done the same inventories we did after the, after the Minneapolis uh, bridge collapse, has, has recognized that I don't think there's a state in the country that I've read about that's actually done the kind of maintenance that should be done on its roads and bridges. And so the, the bill may be different in different states, but the magnitude of the bill is certainly big enough that there probably is a public works type um, program which theoretically could be done. Whether though the available manpower pool is there to be trained and deployed in, a, in an efficient way, in a relatively efficient way, over the shorter intermediate term and whether there's the manufacturing capacity to build the components to put people to work. These aren't, you know, standing out pouring concrete. These are very complex structures that have to be taken down redesigned and put back up. You know, you don't, you're not going to get a lot of crazy glue and go out and fix the Pulaski Skyway. Uh, <laughs> y y y th this is big stuff. And so what I fear is that the lead time on this stuff is such that it really is not a short-term uh, solution for, for what I see out there. Congressman, I don't know how you react. Uh, I, I suspect the answer is yes. Uh, the approach of the government, for example, the federal government in the stimulus package has not gone down that road at all. Um, and after the $600 or $1,200 uh, that a, a, an individual or a couple gets is spent, it's not clear what, what there is. And so some of us argued that for the stimulus we should be doing things that we will want to do anyway, such as repairing the infrastructure. Uh, there is evidence that some things could go ahead quickly. And certainly, I mean, if you go down to transportation here, NJDOT, they've got a whole list of projects that they think they've got the drawings on and they're ready to go. Now, how long it takes to let a contract could be more months than, than, than we have to deal with. Um, contractors who put in solar systems in residential <laughs> buildings say they, they could easily uh, put people to work in weeks. Uh, so they're, they're, but that, that wouldn't amount to the billions that, uh, that, that, that alone wouldn't amount to the billions that we're talking about. So um, I, I suspect the answer is yes, but um, I, I, you know, I haven't seen the solid evidence is mostly talk uh, around committee rooms and, and, and legislative corridors. And on that issue, of course, at some point within the next 15 years, the federal government is highly over leveraged. I mean, we're about at 19% of GDP. If you listen to the Comptroller General, we're going to be at 26% of GDP given the current situation in the, in the spending pattern. I think we have a, a the former Comptroller General. The former controller, right? <laughs> he finally saw the wisdom, right? That's right. And then, go ahead, in the back. Well, right now, we are not deploying any people differently or asking them to behave differently. Uh, what we're going to, I think, start to see is what the capacity of the agencies are to continue to, you know, approve projects. We're going to be committed, and I don't want you to have the wrong idea. We're anything we commit to do, we're going to do. Um, but whether the resources that we continue to be able to call on uh, are sustainable is something we have to monitor. So I don't see anything near term. But I think we are all watching uh, both the incoming flow and also measuring what our capacity is. And we should be doing that in good times and bad. I mean, we, we are crazy. We, we are pretty crazy 
in the state government, just like Seth Pinsky said, although they're maybe even crazier than we are as far as me trying to measure everything. They love them. <laughs> and And they're fun. I mean, I love working with them. We, we work together on the World Trade Center project, and uh, I wish I had their resources. <laughs> but, uh, but, but I, I think right now all we're into, we're just into monitoring, and then we're going to have to figure out whether or not uh, we just make sure we're reaching our grasp or at least con contiguous. Question up front, did you? Yeah, I was curious, Bob. and I'm now so I don't think the problem is the world was so different. If you if we're, you really have to cycle back 16 years, the world was dramatically <coughs> the way you know the, the 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 way business was done was different. The composition of the private sector was different. We weren't really in a globalized economy 16 years ago. Manufacturing was much more important in New Jersey than the service sector was then. So, unfortunately, I don't think there's a lot of relevant takeaways. I mean, we've looked a little at it. I just think that we've got to just use common sense and discipline. I, I, don't, I don't think there's any, any historical data that has value. And, you know, we are no longer, I mean, we can get into the question of U.S., China, India. I mean, there's lots of things in the mix now that aren't there. Well, this is kind of a space-shy question, but I'm trying to put these two, uh, two comments together. Assuming that we're, you know, we're done with the, uh, everybody's done with the second mortgage and the, and the home equity loan and the credit cards, and it's all maxed out. Basically, the country's done this, not just New Jersey. The whole country's done this. And the impulse that led to this you know, tax plan, $600 per household and so forth, and basically the solution, short-term solution is, is get your $600 and run out to Best Buy and buy a television set, and that's going to fix it. I don't know, it seems to like be good for the Korean economy. I'm not sure it's really good for our economy. Should we be thinking about making the transition from a, you know, over time, from a consumer economy to a producer economy? I'm going back to the Congressman, what you were saying about this institution and the other research institutions here in the Northeast and the Tri-State region and the enormous potential they have to create new technologies and, 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 and the foundations for new industries and so forth. Isn't that where we ought to be investing Know, a larger share of our economy, of our economic assets, and our, is that something that government ought to be doing? It goes back to the infrastructure, not, not just fixing infrastructure for public employment's sake, but to create new productive capacity that builds the next economy. I guess it comes back to this notion that that seems like that's what the Chinese are doing, and the Indians are doing, and the people are about to run over us if we don't start doing the same thing. Sure. Sure. Well, of course you're right. I mean, you, you can't sustain a consumer-driven economy terribly long. Uh, and, and the attributes that we have today are really, to some degree, natural byproducts. Of the question is, what do we exchange for um, a, a strong ma manufacturing base? And this can get very personal. <coughs> it's just personal opinion. Um, uh, we are not going to compete in manufacturing with quality workforces that work for 15 percent of an American wage. You know, you, you can't get there. Protection is nothing's going to get you. On the other hand, and this is just me, I wonder if there are some industries that we need to be more protective of because strategically we don't want to see them wither away. They're just skill sets that we shouldn't want to totally lose control over and uh, defer to somebody else to manufacture. Defense sector is an obvious. But, uh, you know, there are certain things that we should say strategically we want to protect without necessarily getting into a broad philosophical trade war. I think it's just being selective. I think a lot of countries are selectively protect certain things for, for different reasons. I think we need to do that. But the rest of it is migrating from a manufacturing sector where we <coughs> just can't compete in the world market uh, for fully loaded labor to something else. And it's traditionally been... You know, ideas, technology has been, which Congressman Holt has, you know, fostered in Einstein's alley. And it has clearly shown 
whatever the pockets that you want to look at, and we're trying like crazy to do it in New Jersey in you know, both technology and biotech and building off of our very powerful pharmaceutical base in this, in this state. We're, we're trying to build uh, lots of the incipient creative jobs that we are educated to do and grow those in the kind of exponential ways that they're going to get grown somewhere. But I think that is really where we have to continue. And look, those are the usual suspects. When we go out and compete for those kinds of businesses, I got to tell you, it, 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 and they need to be somewhere on the East Coast. We're competing with the same places. They, everybody's identified. Them, but we just, there are certain times that where we went is when we have a critical mass here that people want to be near or because they want to be near the New York metro area. Or something. I, I, I would like to add to that. I mean, you're, you're absolutely right that we should put more emphasis on producing. And it doesn't necessarily mean manufacturing in the sense of heavy manufacturing. Economic services as well as That's right. Um, but it, it, you know, in the context of today's discussion of, of, of development, um, it means less of an emphasis on uh, places building hardware and more of an emphasis on people and activities and interactions. Um, and that, I mean, that, it, we, that's what we should be thinking about as we make our development decisions. And uh, w with regard to the, uh, the kind of the international relations and how much we use protection of those things, uh, obviously we, we want to uh, provide, you know, pr put export controls on anything that might be shot back at us. But b beyond that, uh, the, it, it should have to do, I, any discussion of protectionism should have to do with the, this, the, the people and the interactions. Uh, in other words, protecting the dislocations in the workforce that uh, just because there's a lag time in retraining and that sort of thing. Uh, not, I, I mean, I think, it's, I think it's a lost cause to try to save a valuable industry uh, through protectionism. We can save a valuable industry through innovation. Um, that's better said. That's better uh, said. And, yeah. or actually, as Pat Schroeder uh, once said, uh, when she was then the wittiest member of Congress, uh, Barney Frank was second at that time. He's now the wittiest member of Congress. But uh, uh, she said, "You win the Indianapolis 500 by building a faster car, not by putting tax on the track." <laughs> so, right. Yes, sir. Yeah, we, we discussed earlier, you know, different different models of you know between of, uh, of projects and financing public uh, public private partnerships. But to the question that that Alex posed, as sort of the follow up, if we look at the states and the crisis that is this budgetary crisis in a number of states, uh, it's interesting. There, there are models of where PPPs have worked well and where they haven't. Um, but looking at New Jersey, uh, Ed Vendell with his turnpike and Southport. Uh, you know, to what degree do you see, I guess there's a question for both of you in that, is that, of course, in the Dubai world, there are certain people we didn't want investing, but there seems to be a lot of foreign investment, the port investments that were there. To what degree is there a political uh, acceptability of that? And then secondly, financially, I guess, Gary, to what degree do you see that that's still, you know, that the, the Deutsche Banks and whatever are still going to be paying, you know, being able to come in, that, that there'll be a market that potentially could finance uh, a lot of the, uh, some of the, the current prices? Um, I like public-private partnerships if they're structured properly. Um, we need them in New Jersey because it's a way that we can leverage capital that we don't have. And so what we need to do is find out economic opportunities that really both serve job creation as well as allow private capital to come in and get a predictable long-term return. If we're going to do a ports project and it's going to be a couple billion dollars, they're going to want to know when they go to their board for approval that uh, the state is stable and predictable enough that they're going to be able to uh, deliver to their stockholders those kinds of returns. And I think that that's one of the reasons why consistency and predictability in state government is so critical. You know, you, 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 you're talking about 30, 40 year time horizons on those investments. And so we have, we all share those, those issues. But if you can do that, I honestly think you can parse out public-private partnerships and do it right. 
the governor on the turnpike and the highway was so sensitive to the kinds of economic returns that were being generated in, you know, in uh, uh, Indiana and you know, Chicago, where those toll roads were refinanced one year out, and the equity was taken out or dramatically taken out, that he didn't want to have the state be vulnerable to figure being out traded. So we right. created a trading vehicle where, in effect, the state sold it to itself. And the ultimate beneficiary were the citizens of New Jersey, and it required uh, a structure which allowed the state to finance on the most efficient basis. And that's why this public benefit corporation is such a complex piece. Uh, governance and everything, and also had to have firewalls so that everybody would have confidence that there were, is, is a little potential for abuse if possible. And so there's all kinds of redundant systems. And so it's a really well-constructed piece of work. But the short answer to your question is, I do think public-private partnerships can work, uh, but they need to be carefully thought through and make sure that uh, it, it truly, there are economic sharings that work for the state as well as the private equity that, that, that you're being a part. As far as the availability of capital short term, you know, all this leverage debt is trading in the marketplace, if you look, in the 80s. So, <coughs> There's not going to be any capital available at 100% if the secondary market is trading at 80. So I think right now, I think the, the, the leveraged market is pretty much at rest, looking for stability. So I don't think much is going to get done here. You know, unique projects, special situations, sure. But the kind of flows we've seen in the last five years, um, I'd be surprised. Well, on that same issue, you know, that monetization program is, is a best way, it seems to me, or one of the best ways, to maximize assets that the states have to eliminate debt <coughs> that allows to issue more debt. There's not many other mechanisms, it seems to me, that the state has available to accomplish that. Some people talk about the lottery, but that doesn't make economic sense, right, if you think about it. Yes, sir. Father Judge. Problematic, um, somewhat. You know, it was part of an overall set of, uh, and the governor would say this, uh, a report card that he listened to. Uh, and so it was much broader than stem cell. And I don't want to sit here and try to dissect how we got from, you know, a stem cell research program to three facilities and all that stuff. But clearly, the, the way the governor believes that we are missing, that if we don't participate in stem cell research, that we are missing a huge economic uh, opportunity for the state. And so that's what's driving him crazy. He thinks you either are in on the ground floor or not on the ground floor. But clearly, you haven't seen a comeback to that because everybody's trying to a figure out what, you know, how you respond in a thoughtful way, which is consistent with the with the response we got from the governor got. From so I, you know, I'd say highly problematic and one that's undergoing appropriate amount of thought. Tom, I'm going to try and put as a since I work for a nonprofit, I have to be an eternal optimist. So I'm going to try and put a kind of alternative scenario on the table and ask you to respond to it. Also, as a regional planner, really looking at the kind of burdens that inefficient growth patterns and investments in infrastructure, poorly designed investments in infrastructure so that we have congestion, um, the growth in single family, large single family housing. When I worked in the state, we would see the fastest growing counties in New Jersey would have for entire years, two, three years at a time, not a single multifamily dwelling unit approved in the counties in the fastest part of, parts of the state. So, so part of me believes that we have really built in deep, deep inefficiencies. And so that as we're trying to look for new opportunities for growth, we also ought to be looking at how do we weed out some of the really gross inefficiencies that we've got there. And then on the positive side of the ledger, there are two places that New Jersey has seen its economy grow quite dramatically over a kind of more sustained period of time, both the port activity, of course, with the growth that means it's been doubling in every couple of years or so. And then again, through mass transit, too. I mean, New Jersey Transit has seen its ridership into Manhattan and the well-paying jobs there. 
double every seven, eight, nine years over the last 30 years or so. And so we're in this period of unbelievable growth in terms of those two systems. And so there was a question actually that Karen asked earlier about kind of regional coordination and trying to make better investments in those. And we have obviously port fields and ARC and things on the table. Um, but, but is there a way of kind of trying perhaps to weed out those deep, deep inefficiencies in the ways that we've grown so that we can try, rather than just needing the more capital and the new investments and the, the new economy, to figure out how can we create some sustained growth just by much doing much better in terms of what we have? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, housing and yeah. transportation infrastructure are two very good yeah. examples. We, we seem to miss those. It's just, <laughs> you know, what Midtown Direct has generated in terms of economic return. Again, all these things are really are. I wonder, and, you know, maybe you know, Tom, but I wonder if people understood how good Midtown Direct was when it was put in. No. I don't, I mean, I, you know, I live on one of those lines, and it's, what, 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 what was so stunning is what it did for some of the towns that were half not. I mean, that's where the really the we, stunning we, impact we, we I had a student do a study of home values, yeah. and two years before Midtown Direct opened, there was a direct... Alexander Hamilton, Alamater, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah sorry. Uh, two years before it opened, the closer your house was to the train station, the less it was worth. And it flipped. And it flipped. $100,000 of value to every home, and the last thing she did was call every town's planning director and say, what did your town do when Midtown Direct went in to, to, to react to the market forces and the changes? And what would we do? It has nothing to do with us. We're going to break it soon, no matter what. Any other questions, comments, observations? Yes, sir. Uh, it's arguable, but it seems to me we won the Cold War because we invented the semiconductor and Bell Labs. That's but Bell Labs is a diaspora of brilliant scientists in the state of New Jersey. They are not working. They're 40 to 65 years old. And we're losing a big bet. My question is to Rush. Is there some way to convince, I guess it's DARPA, to create non a non-military uh, sort of innovation fund for the country to replace that kind of innovation that was coming out of Bell Labs? Uh, the federal sector investment in R&D has declined even more than the private sector. Uh, and so when, when I invoke um, innovation and, and research as, you know, the, the way to handle the, the flight of manufacturing and all of that, I, it's not magic. I, I'm not just invoking some sort of magic one. There are things one can do to foster innovation, uh, research and development, and entrepreneurship. Now, it's not, I, I don't have the clear answer here, but there's no question that, in my mind anyway, that um, a state or a region or even a municipality can take steps that make it more friendly to entrepreneurs. Now, obviously, the capital question is a problem nationwide, worldwide, but, um, you know, a, a lot of these companies uh, founder for want of a few hundred thousand dollars, uh, you know, not for billions. And um, there are things that can be done to foster the kind uh, or, or to uh, retain or foster the kind of workforce uh, that is necessary. The stem cell initiative is, is a good point. I mean, that, for, for all sorts of humane and ethical reasons, it, it, it made sense, I think. But, uh, uh, and, and the, as in all of these things, the specific economics are hard to quantify. And, you know, not every researcher's annual project at Bell Labs paid off. But Bell Labs sure did, far beyond AT&T. Uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of New Jersey's prosperity still dates from that in ways that people don't even realize. So 
Um, uh, the the um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm rambling a bit here, but your, your point is, um, is right. There are things that the federal sector can do to foster an R&D climate. Um, but we haven't really been doing that, uh, except, you know, NIH doubled from 19, I forget exactly the period, 1990 to 1998, I guess it is. And for a while was on a doubling, a similar doubling path. Now it's kind of leveled off. Uh, uh, physical sciences, social sciences, other areas of innovation um, were never put on that uh, doubling path uh, in federal spending. And the corporations, for reasons that you know, a lot of you know better than I, just uh, took such a short-term bottom line that, that they cut all of their uh, uh, R&D, too. I'm going to so. build on that last point uh, and stretch an anecdote a little too far, perhaps. What, what I think was so unique about Bell Labs was the patience that they had for their intellectual resources. And I wonder, and I, the anecdote is, I remember when I moved to Westfield from Boston in 1974, went to a newcomer's thing with, and met a guy who was there who had, had gotten a doctorate from somewhere, it doesn't matter where, and had spent his first three years working at something at Bell Labs and finally went to the guy who we worked for and said, you know, I'm, I'm hitting the wall here. And his boss basically said to him, I knew you would. But you know you had to you had to I, I, you had to figure it out for yourself. I don't know if there's a corporate environment today that would be that tolerant and that nurturing and that long term. I mean, the message to this guy was sooner or later, you know, you're going to invent the next transistor, or I think you might. And so I've got to let you dream and come to your own conclusions and figure it out for yourself. I think we are perhaps because the world is so much more competitive or whatever set of reasons. I, I don't, whether it's the, you know, the Skunk Works at Lockheed or Bell Labs, those places don't exist anymore other than in your dreams to mine up. It just, it's much tougher. And so I think, and that's where you get the truly revolutionary ideas. I'm just not sure we're doing as well on that score. But, but Silicon Valleys do exist, and they are yeah. not single corporate entities. It, they are regions that are hotbeds of innovation, or Silicon Valley isn't the best example this year, but, uh, you know, you, you can find from time to time here and there these pockets, uh, these hotbeds of innovation. That's fair. And there are Kleiner Perkins in the world who are willing to say, you know, I'll make a portfolio decision and I'll, I'll seed a hundred of these flowers and one of them will bloom. And it'll give me the kind of, you know, it'll be a Google and it'll, you know, overwhelm everything else and it, life is good. John yeah, maybe. Yeah. So it's um, you know it it it, it can be done. Uh, it has been done. That's One final question, if we have. You know, and the other thing I would say that I often say when I'm talking about Einstein's alley okay. is that Silicon Valley was not planned top down. It became the place to be because it was the place to be. And. That, you know, the venture capital was there because the good ideas were there. The good ideas were there because the venture capital was there. We can do that here. But it's, it's a frame of mind as much as it is a, a, a structure uh, or a, um, uh, well, enough said. If it's going to happen, said. this said. is probably the place. This enough said. Yeah. This, right. this, this ought to be yeah. ground zero. Final one since we have a... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, it's follow-up, and, it's, and I'm uh, wondering what uh, your thoughts are, both of you, actually, about uh, Senator Grassley's assault on uh, elite uh, research institutions, and it strikes me, which is where the Silicon Valley came from, that came out of Stanford, and where Bell Labs and all of this came out of, came out of Princeton. Uh, where do you see that going? And shouldn't, this is one place where the Northeast has this, has this incredible stake in, in a set of elite institutions uh, stretching from, from here up to Boston. Uh, and shouldn't we be working together to, to uh, safeguard this unique asset? I mean, there, we've got, what, five or six of the global top ten research universities in the world between here and Cambridge. It seems like we ought to be doing something to 
to safeguard it. Well, and we still have a workforce that hasn't dispersed. Yeah. I mean, there are still Bell Labs people around, yeah. pharmaceutical people work. around, biotech people around, stem cell people around. Um, and, uh, and, and I, again, you know, I made sort of a joke earlier about the, the load that is on the shoulders of Princeton University, because it really is true. Wherever you go and people talk about development, they say, yeah, and we got Princeton. Uh, <laughs> Um, and, you know, I spend a lot of time saying, you know, Shirley Tillman has a different attitude toward these things than, than predecessors, which is good, but, you know, this is, this is no Stanford as far as an economic engine. Could be, but Stanford didn't build Silicon Valley. It grew out of Hewlett's and Packard's garage um, and, and, a, and a dozen other garages uh, like that. Now, sure, there were well-educated people. From Stanford and Berkeley, and but no more so than here. Okay, I think if uh, you join us with a thank you to. Uh, <laughs>